everyone for coming out today. Um, we, I'm Representative Shay Roberts. Uh, I'm one, hi guys. <laughs> I'm one of the co-sponsors of the uh, Reproductive Freedom Act that we filed here in Georgia. We've also uh, Senator Harrell filed the Senate side of that. And um, so today we, I want to introduce my committee members that are here. Uh, we have our the leader of our caucus, James Beverly. <laughs> We have uh, Representative Syra Draper, <laughs> Representative Derek Jackson, <laughs> Representative Tanya Miller, and Representative Lisa Campbell. We may have others circulating in because lots of us had committee meetings and I'm missing one myself right now, but that's okay because this is important and they're not letting us have official committees on topics that Georgians really want to talk about. And so Georgia House Democrats has decided that we're going to hold our own hearings. Um, thank you so much to Melissa and the folks here at Central Presbyterian Church for giving us a place to come when uh, a member of the House of Representatives could not get a room in the People's House to talk about what the people want to talk about. Um, I just am still blown away by that. But we're grateful that our faith community is here joining us here today and is, supports us and, and gave us a home for today's hearing. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the leader real quick to say a few words, and then we'll move into the speakers. Hey, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Yeah. We're good. We're good. Today is a great day. It is a, a fantastic day because you guys are here. And we're deeply, deeply, deeply grateful for your presence. Uh, we are in a time and space where our voices have to be heard. And it seems to me that it's fitting that it would be in the church where it stopped to talk about reproductive freedom. And so I'm deeply grateful to Central Presbyterian for giving us an opportunity just to share. We look forward to hearing from you uh, today uh, because the world uh, needs to hear from you, but more specifically, Georgia needs to hear from you. Really, the voters of Georgia need to hear from you today. So the committee who is chaired by Representative Shea Roberts, I couldn't have a better chair for this committee, uh, is going to uh, guide us through the next couple hours of hearing what Georgians are talking about. Uh, at the end of the discussion, hopefully we'll come up with some action items uh, that we can now move forward with. And so we're depending on y'all. Are y'all ready? Say yes. <laughs> if you're really ready, say yes, yes. <laughs> All right, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, introduce Representative Rua Roman, uh, who has joined us. Yay. <laughs> We've got some amazing, we have 25 freshman Democrats in the house uh, this year. And four of them are represent, represent here and they are fantastic, so we're lucky to have them. Okay, so the format we're going to do today is we're going to let our experts, the goal is to uh, talk about what's been going on over the last 18 months since the abortion ban went into effect. Uh, this is enough time now that we should be able to get a very clear picture of what our providers and doctors and lawyers and everyone are seeing on the ground as it relates to providing reproductive care in the state of Georgia. Um, and so I'm going to start with the speakers. We're going to give them up to five minutes to present what they choose to represent, to present, and then the, the committee will ask questions if they have them, and then we'll move through the, the experts, and then we've got a list that started online and another one here that if anyone from the public wants to share their story or their opinion on what's going on, um, we're going to have up to two minutes for members of the public. So I really, again, appreciate you all for, for being here. And we're going to start with Dr. Nisha Berman. Berman, sorry. Get your name right. You're totally fine. Thank you for having me, um, and thank you to um, you folks for having us here in this location. Um, my name is Dr. Nisha Verma, and I am a board-certified, fellowship-trained obstetrician and gynecologist who provides full-spectrum reproductive health care. So that means I do everything from cancer screenings to delivering babies to supporting people as they decide to continue or to end a pregnancy. I'm a member of the Georgia OBGYN Society, and I'm also a proud Southerner. 
I was born and raised in North Carolina. I currently provide care here in Georgia, and I've lived in the Southeast for most of my life. I decided to stay in Georgia after the Supreme Court overturned the constitutional right to abortion care, and Georgia enacted a law that bans most abortions in our state last year. I decided to stay knowing that Georgia's law threatens to make me a criminal for providing evidence-based, life-saving care to my patients because I made a commitment when I became a doctor to serve my home and my community in the South. But every day, Georgia's law forces me to grapple with impossible situations where the laws of my state directly violate the medical expertise that I gained through years of training and the oath that I took to provide the best care to my patients. Because of this law that's not based in medicine or science, I'm forced to turn away patients that I know how to care for. I've had teenagers with chronic medical conditions that make their pregnancies very high risk, women with irregular periods who don't realize they're pregnant until after six weeks, and couples with highly desired pregnancies who receive a terrible diagnosis of a fetal anomaly cry when they learn that they can't receive their abortion in our state and beg me to help them. Imagine looking someone in the eye and saying, I have all the skills and the tools to care for you, but many of our state's politicians have told me that I can't. Imagine having to tell someone you're sick, but not sick enough to receive care in our state based on this law's very narrow exceptions. One of my patients, I'll call her M, gave me permission to share her story today. She had struggled with infertility and she and her husband were thrilled to see the positive pregnancy test after their embryo transfer. At first, everything was going smoothly. Then at 17 weeks, when there was no chance that the baby could ever develop lungs that would allow it to live outside of her, her water broke. She went to the hospital, but because her baby still had a heartbeat, her doctors were told that, based on Georgia's law, we couldn't do anything to help her. Instead, she had to wait to get sick, to start bleeding heavily, or develop an infection of her uterus that could spread into her bloodstream. M shared with me that to be denied the basic medical care I needed, to be told that I must first be at risk of dying, to be forced to relive losing my baby every day for five days because of Georgia's law, the trauma of that on top of my loss is devastating. She told me that her baby's name was Ezekiel Charles, which means God's strength, and that she would miss him at every major and minor milestone that he would have had in his life. I stayed in Georgia to provide care for people in my community, but my heart breaks every day for patients like M as I bear witness to the pain that they have to carry because of these restrictions on abortion access. I understand that abortion care can be a complicated issue for many people, just like so many aspects of health care and life can be. But I also know that abortion is necessary, compassionate, essential health care, and that my patients are capable of making complex and thoughtful decisions about their health and lives. Despite the Supreme Court's decision and efforts by politicians to create this unjust patchwork of abortion bans and restrictions, I and many of my colleagues are unwavering in our commitment to support people in our home and our community in the South in whatever way we can. It shouldn't have to be this way. People should be able to get the care that they need in their own communities in a manner that is best for them with the people that they trust. I thank you for listening to the stories of people who provide and access abortion care. I know some of you have shared your own heartbreak and outrage and fear for fellow Georgians, and I hope these stories today show that abortion care is not an isolated political issue and demonstrate how profoundly restrictions on abortion access harm all of our communities. Thank you for having me today, and I'm also happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. lived in story, but I have the ability to make the decision, and my daughters don't now, so that's why I fight. Um, I 
just want to, does it, do any of the members have questions? I did have a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Um, Representative Miller, with a question. Um, what kind of advice are you able to give women who come to you and even though you can't yourself personally, based on the laws in Georgia, provide abortion care, what kind of advice are women getting? What options are being are being given to them? Yeah, thank you for that question. So whenever I see someone who isn't able to get care in our state, they're past six weeks, they don't qualify for one of our exceptions, I always start by just telling them, like, I'm sorry that it is this way. It shouldn't have to be this way. This is really terrible. Um, and then I do give them, I do tell them that they can still get this care, but for many of our patients, particularly our patients from minority backgrounds with um, lower resources, it can be really hard to actually implement some of those other options. So I do go through with people that there are options to go out of state. Um, people are having to go further and further as more restrictions are passed in more states. And so again, when you think about everything that has to go into going in, out of state, getting childcare, taking time off work, getting the money together, that is a lot for a lot of our patients. Um, I talk to them about resources like the National Abortion Federation, local abortion funds that can potentially help with some of that um, and then also talk about other methods of getting care but again there are huge limitations for many of our patients to to have to take all of those additional steps to just be able to get health care Yes, Doctor, thank you so much for being here, Representative Sandra Draper. Um, so my question to you is, you mentioned during your commentary the very seemingly intentional decision to stay in Georgia and practice in Georgia even after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, even after the Georgia legislature passed the abortion ban uh, here in Georgia. So my question to you is, you know, knowing that we have a dearth of healthcare professionals to provide all kinds of healthcare services, um, what have you seen among your colleagues and perhaps amongst medical students, how have those policy decisions influenced their decisions about where to practice medicine? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. We've definitely seen, you're totally right, Georgia has a huge um, dearth of providers. I mean, about 50% of our counties don't have an OBGYN, and so there's a huge lack of care here. And we're definitely concerned and have seen that these laws, these restrictions, are making that worse. So I have talked to many medical students, many residents that have said, you know, I'm from the South, I love the South, my family is here, but I don't think I can get the training I need to be the doctor I want to be if I stay in Georgia. Um, because, And again, a lot of the, the medications, the procedures that we use for abortion care are the same procedures and medications we use for miscarriage management. And so I've talked to a lot of trainees that are worried they're just not going to get the training that they need because of these laws and have chosen to go other places. And it's also a scary environment to practice in, right? You have to, instead of just being able to practice medicine, we're having to talk to lawyers to get approval just to practice healthcare, to practice what we've gone through years and years of training to learn, um, and also face that threat of criminal prosecution every day. And so that's a scary environment for people to practice in, and I've talked to also people in states with bands that have chosen to leave, because that's the, the right thing for them and their families. Okay, do we have another question over here? Oh, that was her question. Oh, okay. Um, I had one and I just lost it. Oh my goodness. Oh, well you said that you, you're having to have lawyers come in and, and are they actually regularly part of the team, the practice team? Yeah, so we are seeing that lawyers have become regularly part of these care decisions. Um, so a lot of times when we're trying to decide whether we can move forward under um, one of the exceptions to Georgia's law, you know, these exceptions, this law is written by people that don't practice medicine primarily, that don't understand how medicine is practiced. Exceptions, when you make exceptions for medical emergency, for example, there's not a line in the sand when someone goes from being 
being totally fine to acutely dying. It's a continuum and there's a lot of confusion. We know medically what the right thing is to do. Um, it's to talk to our patient and their family about the options and move forward with the best care plan for them. But in the setting of the law, it's really unclear where that line is. When is when do our politicians that made this law consider it a medical emergency? Um, that is really hard to determine. And so we have seen that lawyers are getting involved in those decisions. Institutional representatives are getting involved in those decisions. Administrators, um, because there's all again, it doesn't make sense. These laws just don't make sense in a medical context and create huge amounts of confusion and delay of care. I have to believe it's also challenging. Um, you know, you have certain standards of care. Obviously, I've heard several doctors say that it violates your Hippocratic oath to put you in this position as well, or you feel as if you're violating yours. Um, but on the civil side, too, malpractice insurers worrying about malpractice, who's going to be held liable? Where you're forced to wait long enough. Uh, is that a concern? Is that anything that you've seen? Um, Absolutely. I've heard multiple people here in Georgia, doctors practicing in other states with bans, talk about this concern of being stuck between criminal prosecution and civil liability um, as we're trying to make these decisions. And honestly, we just we want to be able to offer our patients the standard of care and, and move forward in a way that works for our patient, that our patient chooses. Um, and we just aren't able to do that. We're not able to listen to our patients and hear what, what is the best thing in their life, we're not able to practice the standard of care and are stuck exactly between that threat of criminal prosecution and civil liability throughout that whole thing. Okay, one other question I had, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, I don't know what y'all practically have to do to comply with the law. Who are you submitting paperwork to to show who you deem is more than six weeks pregnant or, like, can you give us the, the practical process of what happens and where that goes? Yeah, so different places have implemented different protocols to try to support their physicians. We've also heard from some clinicians practicing around the state that they don't feel like they have the support they need from their institutions or from their practices, particularly people practicing in like rural environments or private practice. They just don't feel like they have the protection or the support. Some institutions have um, tried to put into place task forces, so groups of like lawyers, um, hospital administration, physicians that have to approve cases whenever uh, we're deciding whether we can move forward with providing care for an exception. There are also institutions that don't have that type of protocol in place, and so there's a lot of variation throughout the state um, in terms of how supported people feel and what protocols are in place. The American College of OBGYNs has recommended that institutions do provide support, provide tasks forces protocols, but we're seeing there's a huge amount of variation and some clinicians just don't feel like they have the support they need to provide any care. And I have to believe that also exacerbates the disparity uh, depending on where these um, patients are trying to get care. Absolutely. We're seeing huge disparities um, from people that live in different parts of the state, rural environments, other places. Okay. Any last questions for Dr. Berman? Thank you, Doctor, for speaking. Um, Rep. Campbell, um, House District 35. Going back a little bit to um, training, education, are you starting to see a change in at the medical school level training, not just residency training, hands-on training, but curricula training? And if so, um, within the OBGYN community, what is the, nat the larger national conversation? Is there one? And how is that impacting Georgia? Um, OBGYNs. Absolutely. So we're definitely seeing effects on training, and there's actually been national studies that have shown that um, fewer and fewer medical students are applying to residencies for OBGYN in states with abortion restrictions. And so we're seeing a drop off of applications because, again, medical students, residents are worried that they can't get the training that they need to provide full spectrum care to their patients. So we've seen this in studies that we're getting a drop off. And I've seen 
working as a, um, a doctor that trains medical students and residents, the training has definitely been affected. We just don't have the same volume to have all of our residents and fellows get the training that they need. Um, and so when we don't have, when residents can't get that training in abortion care, it also affects their ability to provide emergency care to someone who comes in, for example, having a miscarriage. That's the same procedure that's used for an abortion. And so we're affecting a huge spectrum of care outside of simply abortion care. Because of this, we're trying to supplement the training as best we can with lectures, with simulations, with out-of-state rotations. Um, but so many of our residencies are in states with restrictions. There's no way to send all of those trainees to other states. Thank you so much, Dr. Verma. We really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for having me and for doing this. Okay, next up, uh, we have Danielle Rodriguez, the Georgia State Coordinator from Sister Song. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, just a heads up, we have a handout that we're about to give you all um, that is going to be in reference to the Reproductive Freedom Act, um, and the next few speakers will be discussing the Reproductive Freedom Act as well. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, there it goes. I'm Danielle Rodriguez with Sister Song, the National Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. I'm also the co-chair for the Reproductive Freedom Act. I stand here today not just as an advocate for reproductive justice, but as a voice against the narrative that abortion is solely a white woman's issue. It is not just inaccurate, it's harmful. It erases the experience and needs of countless others in our diverse community. Reproductive justice is a universal concern. It transcends race, class, and gender. It's about the rights of all individuals, including women of color, transgender individuals, those in lower socioeconomic groups, and many others who are disproportionately affected by Georgia's restrictive reproductive policies. The Reproductive Freedom Act is our stand against this myopic view. This act recognizes the nuanced challenges faced by diverse communities in assessing reproductive health care. It's a commitment to ensuring that everyone, regardless of their background, has the freedom and resources to make informed decisions about their bodies and futures. The stories I've heard and the people I've met make it clear. Reproductive rights are a critical issue for all of us. We've seen young women of color navigating a maze of oppressive laws, transgender individuals facing formidable barriers to health care, and low-income families struggling to access basic reproductive services. It's time to shatter the stereotypes Type and recognize that reproductive justice is not just a women's issue, not just a white issue, but a human issue affecting a spectrum of individuals in varied and complex ways. I urge you to support the Reproductive Freedom Act and help us get a hearing. Your support is a stand for more inclusive, just, and equitable society where everyone has the right to make decisions about their reproductive health, free from discrimination, stigma, or barriers. Let's work towards a future where reproductive justice is a reality for all, where our diverse voices and needs are acknowledged and addressed. This is our fight, and it's a fight for everyone. Again, we have handouts for your review, and the next few speakers will break down the RFA's benefits. Thank you. Uh, why don't, for folks who may not know um, about Sister Song, can you tell us just a little bit about your organization and how you're working with mm -hmm. these folks on the ground? Yes, so Sister Song is a member-based organization. Uh, we're based in Georgia, but we are national. Um, we are reproductive justice advocates, birth justice advocates, um, and human rights advocates um, in the communities. Um, we continuously hear stories from members of our community, specifically in Georgia, about the access to abortions and um, that six weeks is not enough for them to even know that they are pregnant. Um, folks are looking for options. Uh, where else can they get abortions because Georgia doesn't have options for them? And a bunch of other um, issues that show up for folks in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the other members have questions? We really appreciate you being here. Thank you today. so much.
Okay, I think next we're gonna have uh, Dr. Sarah Red from the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast at Emory University. Rise, right? Yes, okay. Thank you for being here. Absolutely, lots of acronyms, so thank you for <laughs> keeping track of it all. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Sarah Redd, and I'm an assistant professor at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. I am also the director of research translation with RISE, the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast. But perhaps more importantly, I am a Georgia baby. I was born at Piedmont Hospital. Uh, I, was, I grew up in Decatur, and I now live in Avondale. In my research, I study state sexual and reproductive health policy in the United States and how these policies affect the health and well-being of people and their families. I'm here today in my capacity as a researcher to discuss the scientific evidence base that shows the harms of restricting abortion access and the importance of state policies that affirm and protect reproductive autonomy. And I have to give the disclaimer, my testimony reflects my expertise and not the beliefs of Emory University. Always got to put that in there. Um, access to abortion is a fundamental part of reproductive and bodily autonomy, yet Georgia's abortion landscape is extremely restrictive, and the state restricts access to the service in a number of different ways. Um, of course, at the top of my mind is HB 481, the hyper-restrictive ban on abortion after the detection of embryonic cardiac activity, which occurs at roughly six weeks gestation. However, Georgia also restricts abortion access via things like a mandatory waiting period, mandatory biased counseling requirements, parental notification laws for young people, and even bans on coverage of abortion care for people with certain types of insurance, like Medicaid or state health employees' uh, plans. Research has consistently shown that restrictive abortion policies do three main things. First, they severely reduce access to abortion care through banning procedures past a certain point in pregnancy, like HB 481 does, making it harder to get an appointment, decreasing the availability of providers, as we heard from Dr. Verma, and increasing the travel time, distance, and cost of actually getting care. As an example of how these policies reduce access, I and a team of colleagues from RISE and the Amplified Georgia Collaborative published a paper last year in the Open Access Journal of the American Medical Association that provided initial estimates of the likely effects of HB 481 here in Georgia. Using data from 2007 to 2017 from the Georgia DPH, we found that nearly nine in 10 abortions that were provided during this time period would not meet HB 481's requirements. We have received more recent data, 2017 was kind of a long time ago, um, and we are working on updating this analysis, which we're more than happy to share with you all when it's complete. The second thing that restrictive abortion policies do is they increase the risk for adverse outcomes. Things like preterm birth, low birth weight, infant and maternal mortality, mental health challenges, and economic hardship. For example, a 2021 study found that a hypothetical total abortion ban in the United States would lead to a 21% increase in pregnancy-related deaths overall in the first year following the hypothetical ban. However, these effects, the effects of these policies are not felt equally, which brings me to my third point about abortion restrictions. They are tools of white supremacy in that they disproportionately affect and devalue the health of those who are already experiencing structural oppression. This includes black people and other people of color, people with fewer socioeconomic resources, young people, queer people, and more. This can actually be seen in both of the studies that I've already mentioned. Um, for example, in the study about abortion access after HB 481, we found that the ban disproportionately limits access for black people, people younger than 20 years, and people with a high school diploma or less who are seeking abortion care. In the study about pregnancy-related deaths after a hypothetical total ban, non-Hispanic black people would experience the greatest increase in pregnancy-related deaths. It is easy to focus on the negative implications of restricting abortion access because there are simply so many of them. But it is crucial to highlight the other side of the coin, research that shows the positive impacts of expanding and affirming access to comprehensive reproductive health care. Access and use of person-centered contraceptives reduces pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality, improves infant health, increases college enrollment, and reduces the probability of living in poverty. 
Studies have shown that legal abortion access increases women's probability of graduating college by 72%, with a two to three-fold increase for black women, increases wages by 11% on average, and increases both workforce participation and career opportunities. Additionally, studies indicate that abortion legalization in the 1970s actually led to a 30 to 40% decline in maternal mortality rates in communities of color. It is sufficient to say that the current paradigm of reproductive health care in Georgia is not working and is actively causing harm to individuals, their families, and their communities. I know it has caused harm to me, my family, and my community. Our communities deserve new strategies, strategies that are rooted in human rights and reproductive justice. Even science emphasizes the critical need for state policy that affirms and protects access to comprehensive reproductive health care and ensures that people have the autonomy and ability to take care of themselves and their families in exactly the way they so choose with dignity. The Reproductive Freedom Act gives us an opportunity to dream for a better Georgia. Thank you, Dr. I do have one. Uh, thank you, Doctor, uh, for your presentation. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but maybe you could just elaborate on why black people are disproportionately impacted uh, by restrictive abortion laws. I, I, I hear this said, mm -hmm. um, I have my own theories about it, but if there's data out there uh, that would sort of um, put some meat on the bones of that so we could better understand sort of what is happening Absolutely. in our community, I'd like to hear that. Yes, so we actually do have some, and there may be in one of the packets that you all have. Certainly, if it's not in that kind of brief two-page sheet, we can um, circulate the larger, oh, actually, it's right, the, this one right there. That's going to give you probably way more information than you asked for. Um, one of the reasons why um, black pregnant people in particular are disproportionately affected by restrictive abortion policies has to do with both the rate of actually getting abortions and also the reality that we're already living in a white supremacist capitalist society. So when there are um, policies that are designed that put up structural barriers to getting care, it's kind of like a compounding effect. So if you're already experiencing structural oppression, then you have more policies that are placing more barriers to you for getting care. It's sort of like this disproportionate domino effect as to making it more and more difficult for people to actually access care. I'll share the point of clarification. Okay. Um, on the campus, I just want to clarify for the study. So, where it says on table two, number and percentage of abortions provided in Georgia is stratified by weeks of gestation and patient race. I'm noticing that the discrepancy is that, if I'm reading this correctly, those who are white or probably come from better socioeconomic levels are able to access abortions earlier than those who can't, and so therefore that's why we're seeing the discrepancy in the number? That's one of the reasons. Yes, okay. there, there are lots of kind of like, it, it's a very layered kind of okay. situation, but yes, absolutely. Many times it's uh, there's a delay in actually being able to access the care, so that's mm -hmm. part of it as well. <laughs> Bear with me, this is going to sound off topic. Representative Betsy Holland, having just come from a committee meeting where we were very concerned about workforce development in general for our state, and typically what I focused on is the relationship between abortion access and our difficulty in providing nurses and other healthcare workers in the Absolutely. state. But if I understand your research correctly, we are also limiting overall workforce development, readiness for work, educational attainment for women in the state by having these restrictions around the health. Yeah, the research has, is very clear that people being able to being able to have access to abortion is uh, critical for continuing educational trajectories employment opportunities um, essentially you know an, uh, a pregnancy that may or may not be planned can disrupt people's educational and workforce trajectories so that is one of the um, implications absolutely it's a workforce and economic development issue thank you Oh, Brett Campbell? 
Um, thank you for your research. And I'm going to go into the space of dreaming of a place where we have greater expanded access to healthcare, period. But I'm curious to know, within the research, um, as we, um, at, in parallel, see restrictions on access to care, we also see restrictions on um, education and the ability to share evidence-based, science-based sex education in our schools. What, is there data there that we can also link to um, some of these barriers or other um, components that would be important for us to understand as related to health and wellness? Yeah. Um, one one um, kind of uh, theme that is pretty clear in in state policy research is that you know of course abortion restrictions is only one type of policy. It tends to be a pretty good barometer for how supportive states are with other types of policies. As will be of no surprise, we do not have comprehensive sex education. We have not expanded Medicaid. We do not have Medicaid reimbursement for doulas. You know we do not have um, paid family leave beyond FMLA. There are so many other policy level factors that can. Really Really, um, that that just exacerbate all of the issues that we're dealing with now, um, and certainly coming into provider shortages. You know, they're they're all very very interrelated. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, today. thank you. Okay, next, uh, Dr. Zoe Ju Julian from. Women's Health Center. Yay. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks to Representative Roberts and all of the legislators here um, for holding this hearing, allowing us the opportunity to speak about issues that affect all Georgians. Um, my name is Dr. Zoe Julian. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist and I'm also the medical director of abortion services at Feminist Women's Health Center. For over 40 years, our organization has been a leading reproductive rights, health, and justice organization in the Southeast and remains the only black-led and explicitly feminist nonprofit provider of direct reproductive health services, including abortion care in Georgia. Last year, we provided, I'm sorry, we provided compassionate abortion care for over 3,000 people. Um, that includes 80% who are people of color, a third of them who were immigrants or refugees, 15% who identify as LGBTQIA, and over two thirds who required donated funds in order to pay for their abortion care. So it's in service of them and all Georgians that I testify with unwavering support of the Reproductive Freedom Act. As a physician, just as Dr. Verma, I have a front row seat to the abysmal sexual, reproductive, and perinatal health outcomes that plague our state. Today, my patients make healthcare decisions in the context of worsened criminalization of abortion care, rising pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality rates, obstetric and midwifery provider shortages, relentless attacks on queer and trans communities, and continued racialized violence at the hands of militarized police. The six-week abortion ban forces my patients to make really nuanced healthcare decisions urgently before most even know that they are pregnant. Without resources, others are forced to continue pregnancies against their will, like the mother of two I cared for last year who was in excruciating pain from sickle cell disease, who upon learning that she was eight weeks pregnant, begged me for abortion care that I wasn't legally permitted to provide. This ban forces me to go against my medical training and my professional ethics, denying people the safe and high quality medical care that they need. Because of enforced constraints and the frequent lack of insurance coverage for abortion care, many of my patients have mere days after their first positive pregnancy test to raise funds to pay for their abortion, secure adequate transportation and childcare, ensure time off from work or school without penalty. Additional restrictions particularly punish lower income folks and victimize youth like the mandatory 24 hour waiting period, the medically inaccurate Women's Right to Know Act, parental notification laws for pregnant youth seeking abortion, and a 22 week limit for patients with pregnancies resulting from rape or incest. 
These policies do not reflect evidence-based medical practice. They do not keep my patients safe. Instead, they interrupt the sacred patient-provider relationship, causing deep moral injury and making our state unattractive to the high-quality health providers that Georgians deserve. The Reproductive Freedom Act would remove both the six-week and the 22-week abortion bans, expanding insurance coverage for abortion care and protecting Georgians from prosecution for pregnancy outcomes, repealing harmful legal hurdles that are medically unjustified and make it easier for young people to access abortion. With this legislation, I can do exactly what I was trained to do, provide excellent abortion and pregnancy care to whomever needs it. This bill gives us a fighting chance to expand both abortion access and improve the health and well-being of all Georgians. I'm committed to a future where Georgians have the rights and resources to make our own decisions about if, when, and how to build and care for our families with dignity in safe and sustainable communities. The Reproductive Freedom Act is an urgent critical step to not only ensure abortion access for all Georgians who seek it, but it is indeed foundational to making this collective liberatory future a reality. I urge all members of the Georgia legislature to support this essential policy and bring our state one step closer to reproductive freedom. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I, I have one that I kind of asked Dr. Burma that I don't think I was articulate. Um, there's a reporting process of when you have a patient mm -hmm. and you do an ultrasound and you figure out whether they're who is it report how is it reported? I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of mm -hmm. of what you're required to do now to protect yourself from going to jail. Like what date? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the short answer is there is very little information within HB 481 that tells us exactly how to do that. Um, and I believe that's by design. So the law in and of itself is incredibly vague about how exceptions should be documented, what reporting re mechanisms are required. Um, and so as Dr. Verma said, there is a heterogeneity across different facilities, hospital systems, individual abortion clinics like ourselves on how to create mechanisms, practices, and policies in order to make sure we are appropriately documenting the care we're providing. Um, a lot of that can be done in environments that feel incredibly fearful because we're not given any guidance on how to do that appropriately. Um, and so there have been you know, several providers, individual providers, but also clinics throughout the state of Georgia and throughout the Southeast and other restricted states that have closed merely because they don't feel confident in being able to provide the appropriate documentation, even if they have the providers to do the care the, um, the amount of expertise that's required is all present. But again, this fear of criminalization, this fear of persecution, this fear of, of um, medical liability prevent people from moving forward. Um, I think I know the answer to this because I think we would have heard about it in the news, but are you aware of any threats of um, prosecution to anyone in the state? Um, I'm not aware of any specific threats of prosecution to anyone in the state. Um, but again, I think the fear that a bill like this employs is another way to restrict abortion access, is another way to limit the reproductive freedom of Georgia. Completely. I agree. I just was curious. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Dr. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Um, I have less of a question, more of a comment. And thank you uh, for the work that you and your organization do. Um, so I faced an unplanned pregnancy after the abortion ban was set in place in Georgia. Um, I had two children already at home, um, and I had an OBGYN that I saw regularly that led me through three pregnancies, uh, two, pregnancies two pregnancies that I gave birth, one um, a miscarriage, but I had doctors that I relied on. Mm -hmm. When I faced this unplanned pregnancy, I went to those doctors that I had relationships with and relied on. And when I asked about my options, they told me they couldn't help me. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a list of providers that would be able. They, they were handing me off. Mm -hmm. Your organization was on that list. You helped me. And I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate you. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Zoe Bambara of ARC Southeast. person to ever pronounce my last name correct <laughs> on the first try. <laughs> well, as someone who gets Shia all the time, I understand. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to start off with a quote. Um, in her book, Killing the Black Body, Professor Dorothy Roberts states, we need to reconsider the meaning of reproductive liberty to take into account its relationship to racial oppression. My name is Zoe Bambara. I am a full spectrum doula, and I am the community and volunteer engagement coordinator for ARC Southeast. I am from Georgia, born and raised. I am a Crawford Long baby. Real Atlanta folks would know. I wanted to put that in there, <laughs> no shade. Um, at ARC, we provide provide funding and logistical support to ensure Southerners receive safe and compassionate reproductive care, including abortion, including abortion services. We envision a world where all Southerners have full access to care and support around their reproductive health decisions without biases or barriers. In Georgia, abortion is legal after six weeks, and at the same time, we have the third highest black maternal mortality rate in the country. That is a disgusting reality and just one example of why the Reproductive Freedom Act is, is desperately needed. What black reproductive organizers have said long before Roe was overturned, that banning abortion would not stop abortions, it would only stop safe legal abortions from happening, and that has become the reality in Georgia. In Georgia, there have been at least nine rural hospital closures since 2010, pulling Georgia third in the nation for hospital closures, only behind Tennessee and Texas, states that also have repressive abortion bans in place. Why does it seem like death is our only option instead of widely accessible resources, reproductive health care, and prioritizing the health of marginalized communities? While the state of Georgia prioritizing commits to projects like the 91 million cop city, our 2023 data points a very contrasting picture for where priorities should be. The average one-way distance had to travel for abortion was over 150 miles. Over 87% of the people ARC Southeast supported were uninsured or on Medicaid, and nearly 500,000 Georgians have been dropped from Medicaid within the last year, with that number expected to increase even more in the coming weeks. And all of our callers, over 82% identified as black, and 77% reportedly already having children. This paints a very clear picture of who needs reproductive support in Georgia, working class black parents who are forced to travel far and wide for basic medical care. These are the people we should be funding, and these are the people the state leaves behind by prioritizing projects like Cop City over community care. The expansion of our bodily autonomy and accessible reproductive health care is vital for our communities to not only live, but thrive. Forcing individuals into parenthood or potentially dangerous pregnancies without accessible health care, jobs with living wages, affordable housing is evil. Regardless of race, class, gender, and religious beliefs, everyone should have the self-determination and autonomy to determine their reproductive choices with trained medical professionals. This is a case for all medical procedures, and an abortion should be no different. The RFA would provide protections for all community members with the ability to be in charge of their own reproductive health and to ensure that reproductive care is accessible to every single person. Our communities know about inadequate care all too well because of, and because of that we'll continue to organize. Elected representatives need to do their part no matter what party they're from. Please call for the Reproductive Freedom Act to get a hearing and vote in the official committee. If you care about economic freedom, you have to care about reproductive justice because someone's class status should not determine their ability to access abortion, access abortion. If you care about climate justice, you have to care about reproductive justice because the same ones who will be directly impacted by climate change will be the same communities that are not access to safe abortions. If you care about affordable housing, you have to care about reproductive justice. If you love your community, you have to care about reproductive justice. Yeah. Reproductive freedom is the foundation of liberation. We must continue to fight for ourselves, our families, and our communities. Talking won't change anything. Mouth don't win the more. Community building and organizing does. Thank you. I'm curious, mm -hmm. where are women have, like what state, is it Florida is the closest one currently? Um, Florida is, but there is a ban, well we're, 
we're holding our breath because we think they're about to have a six-week abortion ban sometime soon. But they also got petitions signed by enough signatures uh, to maybe do a ballot. Uh, constitutional ballot initiative. I don't know. Really? I, I did not know that. Yeah, there way, awesome. but the Supreme Court has to approve the language of it. I'm just don't want to hold my breath. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> I was so like excited when I saw it because it was like 800,000 signatures. Oh, that's it was beautiful. a lot. But, yeah. Um, anyway, so where, if not Florida, where do you, I'm just curious where yeah. you're having to travel to? Um, I'm not on the health line, um, but I was shadowing the health line and it seemed like it was up north, Maryland, and anybody can jump in, um, but I'm merely at DC, uh, Chicago. Chicago, Ohio, not Ohio, I'm sorry, Colorado. Um, just up okay. north, far and wide, yeah. Far away. Yes, far away, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. Okay, thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> We're going to hear from Reverend Allen. Yes. Organizing manager of Faith and Public Life. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much to Representative Roberts uh, for your leadership to the Democratic Caucus and the House for having this hearing. You shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, and they shall render just decisions for the people. You must not distort justice. You must not show partiality, and you must not accept a bribe. My God. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Justice, and only justice, shall you pursue. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. According to a Public Religion Research Institute survey in February 2023, the majority of people of faith agree that abortion should be legal and available in all or most cases. I'll repeat that. According to a PRRI survey in February of 2023, the majority of people of faith agree that abortion should be legal and available in all or most cases. There are two key reasons why people don't know this statistic. One is that people of faith who believe in reproductive freedom are not the loudest voice in the room under the gold dome. It is a travesty and it is a shame. And we, all people of faith, myself included, must show up and not just behind closed doors, but be loud and present and speak up for the safety of others and for our collective well-being when it comes to reproductive freedom. We're with you, but it is now time for us to stand with you. I'm here not only to demand that our electeds hold a fair hearing for the Reproductive Freedom Act, but that faith leaders who believe in reproductive justice come out, come out wherever you are. The second reason people don't know that faith leaders agree with the Reproductive Freedom Freedom Act is because faith leaders don't have the language to speak about the values and theologies that undergird our beliefs. The opposing side, the religious minority, have their talking points down ad nauseum. That is where groups like Faith and Public Life come in. My name is Reverend Leo Sage Allen. I'm here as the Georgia Organizing Manager at Faith and Public Life Action, our C4, to say that faith leaders are not the silent majority. minority. We are the faithful majority, and we will be silent no more. At Faith and Public Life Action, we've developed messaging and media trainings, workshop content, and a grass tops cohort framework to educate and empower dozens of people of all faith traditions across Georgia to speak competently, compellingly, and courageously for reproductive health and equity. We would love to come to your place of worship, your school, organization, or committee hearing. Yes, I'm talking to you, Representative Cooper and Senator Strickland, to provide more information on the data. Not only as to why Georgia needs protected and expanded reproductive freedom, but how and why faith leaders support it. Faith and Public Life Action is proud to be a campaign partner of the Reproductive Freedom Act. We believe that in both times of crisis and in times of moral clarity, God is with us. God gives us bodies that are whole 
and hearts that are capable of deciding what is best for those bodies and our futures. We are the experts of our lived experiences. We are the experts of our lived experiences. The Reproductive Freedom Act, House Bill 75 and Senate Bill 15 deserve a committee hearing today, today, today. It is shameful that some legislators would dare hide behind a cloak of religious freedom to deny thousands of Georgians the access to the health care they need, which is a God-given right. Now this might hurt you a little bit, but I want you to help me and turn to your neighbor, the person sitting right beside you, and just say yes. yes. Come on a little bit louder, say yes. yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, people of faith say yes. To reproductive health care. People of faith say yes. Say yes. yes. To reproductive justice. People of faith say yes. yes. To reproductive freedom. People of faith say yes. yes. To health care for everybody, regardless of religion, race, zip code, or race. People of faith say yes. yes. To the right to have or not have children. People of faith say yes. yes. To bodily autonomy. People of faith say yes. yes. To safe, healthy, and sustainable communities. Come on, hang in there with me. People of faith say yes. yes. To Justice and only justice. People of faith say yes, yes to better for our communities. People of faith say yes, yes to better for Georgia. People of faith say yes, yes to supporting the Reproductive Freedom Act. Yes. Thank you. You always get us riled up. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing in your community. Um, I guess I have one question. Are are you counseling members in your faith in your community on these issues that are suffering through this, and, and what are they telling you? You know, that's an excellent question, Representative Roberts. And um, we have had a cohort uh, a, we had a cohort nationally, and there were several uh, ministers, imams, rabbis that came together um, over the past year, from April to December, and we kept hearing stories of people saying that in their synagogues, in their mosques, in their churches, in their places of worship, they were having to counsel people behind closed doors who were deciding whether or not they could travel far enough and get the funds together to even seek abortion access. Um, this is definitely something that uh, people of faith are having to provide pastoral and spiritual counseling for, um, but it is also something that we have to step beyond those closed doors and come out and speak out and testify and come and knock on doors, write letters, send emails, call, call, call our elected officials. Um, but this is something that we're continuing to hear of. Uh, it is really a shame. It is a travesty uh, that people do not know where to go in Georgia. And we have very few resources like Arc Southeast and Feminist Women's Health Center to provide for those individuals. So yes, we're continuing to hear story after story after story. We're even hearing religious leaders come forth and tell their own reproductive justice story in those cases. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, so thank you for being here. It's good to see you in person. Um, and first and foremost, thank you for the work that you were doing because that is something I'm seeing in my community. Um, this is a question more of a comment of within the Muslim community and the Muslim faith, abortion is actually allowed and in the case of saving a mother's life, it is mandated essentially. Yes. yes. Um, and there was a piece that you said about how there are a lot of people that don't have the language the way the other side does. And I see this time and time and time again where we're actually seeing that language, that anti-choice language, that um, anti sort of healthcare access language permeate into our communities even when those faith traditions do not share those values. Right. So thank you for what you're doing because it has been really helpful to push back on some of that messaging that I mean I'm seeing this in our you know group chats and our community conversations of you know having to explain to people, hey, like no, we don't need to have have a full ban at conception that's not something we believe and they're shocked by it. So yes. really, really appreciate what you're doing here. Yes. We're going to keep pushing back. We're going to keep reclaiming that, Representative Roman, because too many times faith and religion have been weaponized in all types of forms of oppression, and religious uh, liberty is being used as an excuse to actually stop reproductive freedom. But we're going to reclaim that narrative. We know that in the Jewish faith and the Muslim faith and the Christian faith, and people love to purport Judeo-Christian values, they don't know what their book actually says. Their book actually says that the pregnant person's life is prioritized, and as you said, in uh, Islam and also in Judaism, it is mandated that that is the life to be put first. Justice and only justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Thank you so much, Governor uh, Donald, for sharing with us today and being here. And I'm, I'm a native Georgian too, and like a lot of native, native Georgians, um, you know, the, the Protestant Christian tradition is my tradition. And I, I do, can you speak at all to like how did this get so hijacked? Um, in other words, how did um, anti-choice voices become the voice of people of faith on this issue? Um, and thank you for your comment as well about kind of we need the language because it's it's hard to talk about um, when you don't have the language. But but how did this get so hijacked by one side of the Christian faith? You, you know, this is an excellent question, and we could say this about so many issues of injustice. Um, the way that uh, the religious minority, and I like to call them out as a minority because as they, much as they want to be the loudest voice in the room, we are the faithful majority. And the majority of people of faith believe in reproductive health care and believe in reproductive health care access um, more importantly. But where this started is in understanding people's um, dire, desperate attempt to control, to control mind, body, spirit. And in, and in doing that, we know that um, the religious history of this country is not necessarily one of religious freedom, but it's where religion has been used to impose and restrict freedom of ability of people to move right where they live, um, whether or not they have or don't have children. And so how can they care for those children in communities that are safe and whether those communities are are better than others, whose life matters more than another person's. Um, the under the truth is that it's undergirded in white supremacy. The, uh, the truth is that it's undergirded in settler colonialism. The truth is that it is undergirded in an evil, sinful system of racism and apartheid and a caste system that says certain people matter over others. I think that um, the history in the United States in particular is interesting because it was uh, really, I truly, and this is shocking to a lot of people, but it was Catholics who worked underground to make sure that when Roe v. Wade was not the law of the land, that people could travel to and from where they needed to go to access abortion care. That narrative had been so twisted and so flipped that we know now that we're fighting to try to bring the Catholic Church along and say so the, the, real, the real history of it is, um, the real truth of the matter is that that history is what we need. And we know history and truth in Georgia is under attack. So what can we do as we, as we heard from Arc Southeast every single issue is intersectional. We need to come down. We need to support you all for the work that you're doing, but we need to be knocking on the doors of people who do not agree, who are not supporting this for a hearing, and let them know that this is a part of the true history of Georgia. This is a part of the true history of people of faith, that we affirm reproductive health care, and that we're here to reclaim it no matter what. Thank you. Great question. So we often hear, you know, this is a metro issue. <clears throat> are you talking to faith leaders out in rural areas that are perceived to be more um, fundamentalist, conservative Christians? Mm -hmm. are, are you having conversations out there? Because they need to be talking to their legislators too. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> so we are having those conversations. As a matter of fact, um, part of our reproductive cohort that ran from April to December of last year, as I stated, included folks from Augusta. Uh, the Macon Bibb County area, Savannah, Georgia. Um, and there are others in more rural communities as well uh, that we hope to bring into the fold. I'm really proud of the, the research and the data that Amplified Georgia Collaborative has been gathering in some of those areas so that we can tell a more holistic, comprehensive picture um, that there are people of faith across the state, not just in the Atlanta metro area, right? And not just progressive white folks, but there are people everywhere that support the RFA. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that um, is the end of our expert speakers, I guess. Um, is there, I think there were a few people that signed up in the public that wanted to speak. Um, you can just raise your hand and I'll, yeah, okay, that's perfect. Come on in. Let's give them a call. Well, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you to the committee for having us and creating this space for us to speak. Um, my name is Alina Hoover. I'm an OBGYN going through additional training uh, after residency to subspecialize in complex family planning. As an OBGYN, I have a unique insight into the complexity that surrounds the care for pregnant patients and seeing how vastly pregnancy experiences can differ for different people. Prior to working in Georgia, I worked in Virginia, where patients had access to care with far fewer restrictions than they 
do here. I saw how appreciative patients were to have this care, but I also saw the lengths to which patients from other states had to go to get their abortion. I cared for multiple patients from Georgia who had to travel, who had to leave behind their families and support systems, and who had to delay their care for abortions a lot of times, even for pregnancies that were high risk and putting their lives at risk. One such patient had to undergo a complex pelvic surgery and hysterectomy because her placenta had grown through and beyond her uterus. And then she had to, several days after major abdominal surgery, fly back to Georgia and couldn't follow up with us, her surgical team. Since moving here, I've seen the magnitude of the burden that the six-week ban puts on patients. A ban at this early gestational age provides an unnecessary layer of pressure and stress to patients who are simply trying to make a decision that's best for them and their families. I also want to emphasize the additional restrictions that exist on patients. The 24-hour waiting period, the requirement for a police report in cases for rape and incest, and the requirement for parental, um, uh, for parental consent all severely infringe people's access to what should be routine health care. As someone who has dedicated their career to medicine and to the academic study of female reproductive health care, I can tell you that these restrictions and this ban have no medically founded indication and no research to support them, as we've already heard very extensively today. I often care for patients undergoing abortions for fetal or maternal indications. So I see patients going through heartbreak when they learn about their fetal anomalies that are incompatible with life. But then this heartbreak is compounded by them having to navigate a complex legal system while trying to not break unnecessary laws. These restrictions also make abortion incredibly difficult to access, especially for patients who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, who live in rural areas, and who are marginalized with poor access to care. Therefore, the Reproductive Freedom Act has been created to protect the people of Georgia by lifting these medically unindicated restrictions and broadening access to care. Pregnancy is an exceedingly personal experience that can mean many different things to many different people. The decision to continue or terminate a pregnancy should therefore be a personal one. Politicians have no role to play in making these decisions other than protecting people's access to make this decision. I owe it to my patients and we owe it to our fellow Georgians to protect their freedom, dignity, and their right to comprehensive reproductive health care. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You're here doing extra training, mm -hmm. so will you go back to Virginia, or are you? That's to be determined. Uh, okay. <laughs> Still figuring out some things. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, are you providing care in Georgia mm -hmm. now? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I would love your honest opinion if you're willing to give it. That are you encouraged? I, I mean, it's got to be scary to provide care here after coming from that environment. Yeah. I mean, so. It's, it's heartbreaking for my professional identity, right, to have to go from what was more of a surge state, safe haven state, to come here. But it's also reaffirmed the necessity for this care and realizing there are so many people who need this care and who need people to fight for this care for them. And so, um, I mean, it, it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Oh, Rev Evans has joined us. Hello. Yes, hello. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Come on up. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Olivia Harrison, and I am a resident of House District 82. I'm here today with Atlanta's chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, a core member of the RFA campaign. Uh, Monday was the 51st anniversary of the passing of Roe v. Wade, and many of us were, of course, thinking about how its overturning opened the doors for Georgia's six-week abortion ban, which is an assault on working people. In particular, black women and other women of color, young people, rural families, and queer and trans people who already struggle so much to receive adequate and affordable health care in this country. 
but the truth is abortion rights have long been under attack in this state. Roe was never enough for most Georgians. Legal protections around choice are completely meaningless without actual access to care. Until all working people are afforded unfettered access to reproductive care, choice is an illusion. It is your job as our elected officials to make good on the promise of choice. A clear and effective way to do that is by sorting, supporting Georgia's Reproductive Freedom Act, which goes beyond Roe by enshrining protections for reproductive freedoms into law, expanding access to abortion care, and repealing medically unnecessary restrictions that create barriers to care. Sign on to, the, to support the RFA if you have not already done so, and demand that it is heard this session. For over a year, I've spent countless volunteer hours knocking doors and speaking to folks at community events around the metro Atlanta area about the RFA. It's clear working people want their access to reproductive care not just protected, but expanded. They see the RFA as a path forward in making that happen, and they're counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm almost positive that every single one of us have signed on. <laughs> if you have it, you better get Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Jamat, and I'm an internal medicine physician, and I have a Master of Public Health specializing in reproductive health. I advocate for reproductive justice, and I'm here today to highlight the importance of eliminating government, government involvement in abortion care. As we already heard today, elected officials in Georgia should do this by implementing the Reproductive Freedom Act. Georgians do not want politicians interfering in their personal health care decisions. You've heard the data. We know that one-size-fits-all laws do not work when people are making complicated and personal medical decisions. Moreover, especially in an election year, let's remember democracy begins with bodily autonomy. Uh, first, I want to um, echo previous speakers and state clearly that abortion bans and restrictions do nothing to protect anyone's health or safety and have been devastating for patients and providers in Georgia. I want to emphasize that Georgia's early abortion ban not only forces providers to deny patients basic, essential, evidence-based health care, it also forces patients to travel to other states and remain pregnant against their will. Moreover, it's crucial to understand the big picture. This ban is endangering the health of generations of Georgians. Medical training in a state with an early abortion care ban means Georgia's training programs are unable to continue to attract top talent. Medical professionals are unable to be trained in the standard of care in their states, and providers are unable to transfer knowledge to their trainees. This places every person in Georgia trying to access reproductive health care presently and in the future at risk. Current patients do not receive care, the next generation of providers are not receiving comprehensive training, and the future reproductive health patients will not be able to access the care they need. We cannot afford to continue to accelerate this public health crisis in Georgia, in a state that already suffers from a staggering maternal mortality ratio and a shortage of health care providers. I want to end with one mantra from the reproductive justice movement. Everyone deserves access to health care for their community, in their community, and by their community. I encourage legislators to move the Reproductive Freedom Act forward and into law. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. I think I've heard that some of the doctors that train in our medical schools go out of state for their OBGYN fellowships. Is that correct? Or do they for some training like on, on abortion care? Like there's like a rotation where they go to a state that allows it. Is that right. true? I believe that is what they're doing, um, and it would depend on the school. That is what multiple training um, programs around the country are trying to do, but you have to actually think about what that requires, right? That requires them to rent, right? Lodging in another state, pay for travel, leave their families. Right. Um, and so people do get the training, but right, 
doctors are training their whole lives, right? Mm -hmm. They're continuing to be, to have cases and um, and to get better as they go on. Right. Well, I'm not saying it's satisfactory, but I'm just saying that, that's mm-hmm. what I understand. People in every medical school, they're, they're training at places in states where abortion is illegal. They're, so it's a part of their, you know, they have to train students at other institutions yeah. to get the care that they right. should, you know, they right. should be able to learn here, you know, to care for their own patients. Right. And our state shouldn't be forcing other states to take to that's take care of, of it too. <laughs> right, to, right, to take care of our patients and right. to take care of our providers. That's, That's our job in our state. That's a good way to put it. Thank you. I have a follow-on question. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and thank you for speaking today. So similarly, um, as that lifelong learning and that continuing education continues, I guess it would be the likely next step to say um, our medical community will not be involved in the latest technology, science, and medicine as related to reproductive care. Absolutely. And to really think about, right, Emory University, the CDC, we are a leader in the country in this. And um, this is... So it's, a, it's a barrier to bodily autonomy, but it's also a barrier to the expansion of science and the health and wellness of all Georgians. Yes. Exactly. Yes. We're talking a lot this session, I'm Representative Westbrook, by the way. We're talking a lot this session about healthcare generally, about uh, maternal mortality. And um, can you talk a little bit about how these issues um, that you're seeing in the medical profession intersect with this, this issue of maternal mortality? For example, you know, we know that roughly half of Georgia counties don't have a practicing OBGYN, period. Um, we've got barriers to other medical professionals offering some of this type of care. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about how these two forces sort of come together, uh, restrictions on abortion and the, the very high rates of maternal mortality that we have in Georgia, particularly for black women? Okay. Um, so where to start? Where to start? <laughs> <laughs> um, bring the mic to you. Okay. There you go. Um, wow. So I try to think which angle to, to be in from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's the idea that let's talk about um, access to care, mm-hmm. right? And it, it's about being able to receive prenatal care. It's about being able to um, receive prenatal care before you decide to get pregnant, much less in the beginning of your pregnancy. <laughs> um, it's about so many uh, people who can get pregnant in Georgia requiring Medicaid in order to be able to access health care, which is a human right. Um, and understanding that the postpartum period extends a year after having um, having a child and being able to get health care during that time as well. Um, that's, that's, yeah, I, I know it was <laughs> multi-layered. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. I hate to break the streak and being like a straight male up here. Uh, (laughs) But yes, yes. You know, I think it's just as important for men to be as involved in supportive industry. Because women and queer folk here in Georgia need reproductive access. And my name is Gabriel Sanchez. I'm running as a Democrat for State House District 42, which is Smyrna, Cumberland, and Dobbins Air Force Base. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank the House Democratic Caucus for making this hearing happen because this is the stuff we need to do. If they're not going to let us do it in there, then we'll do it ourselves. And that's the kind of organizing work we need to make this happen. Um, You know, our, the state of reproductive health care is in dire straits in Georgia. The overturning of Roe v. Wade with the heartbeat bill in place. The maternal, maternal mortality rate, especially for black women in this state, is despicable. 
and we've also defunded institutions that provide reproductive health care in the state. Abortion health care, but also all forms of reproductive health care for expectant mothers in general. And do, folk, even though they claim it's for abortion, they're impacting all forms of health care with these kinds of bans. And all of these issues are connected to broader issues, you know, racism, education system, and of course, the broader uh, healthcare space. We have areas where the highest teen pregnancy rates are the places where they only teach abstinence in schools. That is not a coincidence. We need proper sex education because that is vital to reproductive health care for now and the future. We need to stop the systemic racism that is cr creating this huge disparity for black women in maternal mortality rates. We, there's so much work that needs to be done and there's people in there who believe racism has been solved. <laughs> that is insane. We, the evidence shows otherwise and we have to fix it. And we have to provide not just health care, but free quality health care to every single Georgian to provide for reproductive health care and health care overall. I'm glad the Republicans are starting to talk a little bit about expanding Medicaid, but you know, let's stop the talk and let's start doing some action so we can actually do some work for the people of Georgia. And we have to expand Medicaid as soon as possible. And then the second we do that, we keep on going until every single Georgian has guaranteed health care. And then, of course, we have to push for the Reproductive Freedom Act because that is what will make sure that reproductive health care is alive and well here in Georgia. The heartbeat bill only passed by three votes in 2019. If we can get it on the floor to bring back Roe and more, we can win. That's why they're blocking it, because they know once it's on the floor, they're going to lose. And that's why they're blocking it, because they know that the majority of Georgians support this. They need to represent the regular working people of the state of Georgia and not themselves and their donors. This is why these kind of hearings are important. Because when we have the majority blocking these things, what we need to do is we need to go to the community and organize in our communities so that we can put so much pressure on them that they have to let it through. Because they're using procedure to block us. We need to organize in order to, to get around that and out-organize them. You know, I worked a lot with Amplify Georgia and Atlanta DSA uh, to help secure over $300,000 from the city of Atlanta budget to Arc Southeast to help provide abortion access to people in the city of Atlanta who need it. And we also helped uh, get the Cap County to decriminalize abortion. And these are the kind of things that we need to continue to do across the state. Local organizing that can build up to the pressure till we get back to the state capital and let them know what Georgians want. We need to let them know that their jobs will be on the line if they don't provide the reproductive health care access that we need in Georgia. And so let's organize, let's fight, and let's win reproductive health care for women in Georgia, for queer folk in Georgia, and for all Georgians in general. Let's do this. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that wants to speak today? You Sorry, got here just for the very end. Oh. <laughs> this is Representative Long Tran. <laughs> He's been our faithful. He was here at last year's hearing that we did. So, so I guess no. the call to action to everyone, including myself, I think all of us, we need to go corner Sharon in our office uh, this week. What do y'all think? <laughs> um, and we need everyone calling, emailing, showing up on doorsteps <laughs> to the governor. I don't know if y'all listened to his state of the state, but I have I captured this sentence right away. He said, "We trust our citizens more than we trust the government." I should write that down. And yeah. if that were true, <laughs> we trust yeah. Georgians to make their own health care decisions. We trust our doctors to do what they're trained to do. We also <laughs> trust our teachers to teach what they what they know to teach. There's all kinds of things I can think of. So. So make sure you throw that back in the governor's face and say, you said this. Um, yes. uh, 
Um, but the Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House, all the committee members that are going to be, would be deciding this decision if they would give us a hearing, keep bombarding them. Keep reaching out to other folks in districts where Republicans are leading it to make sure that they're voicing their concerns because a lot of the problem is they don't listen to anybody but the people voting for them. And we know the numbers are there. 77% of Georgians, maybe more now, I don't know. I can't wait to get the new numbers um, from Amplify. Um, but um, we know the numbers are there. It's just whether or not people are going to be as vocal about it as maybe we are here. Um, but we need to hold them accountable in November. Um, people need to start voting this issue. Um, this, in, in my opinion, gun laws, uh, common sense gun laws, and these are things that are killing Georgians right here every day in all of our communities. And so um, this group and the rest of my caucus, we are fighting hard, um, trying to do something here. Uh, it's <laughs> It can get depressing, I can tell you. Um, but we won't stop fighting until we've restored reproductive freedom and expanded it for everyone. So, uh, yes, Sarah. I just have a policy question. How realistic do you think it is that there would be a hearing in this session, knowing how hard it's been to get any kind of hearings on commons and reforms? Like, just, you know, pediatric safe storage barely got a hearing. So, I, I don't have a magic wand, and I would, if I gave it odds, it wouldn't be good odds. Um, but I do know that we have spent every, almost every morning in the well and afternoon orders talking about maternal mortality, and it's getting under their skin. I've held press conferences on this topic this week. Next week, it's going to be common sense gun safety issue. We've picked issues that we know are important to Georgia before session started. Rep. Cannon did one on um, maternal mortality. Then we've had one. On, uh, Rep. Al did one on Medicaid expansion. So we are in their face every day talking to the public and our voters around the state, showing them that Democrats are who is talking about what's important to Georgians, a majority of Georgians. Um, I get the question every day, why can't we do a ballot initiative or a ballot referendum? And unfortunately, our constitution doesn't provide for that. Um, so we've got to dig in and flip more seats and elect people that have the same values we do and want the same things we want for our community. It's yes, ma'am. Sorry to keep asking, but is it more of a messaging thing? I, I'm definitely left the center, so y'all have me, but I know that there are women and men that get confused and think abortion is just you know, like 40 week old babies are being aborted. And it's like, it's, it's so bizarre how they would have taken that narrative. But what can we do in the community to be more? easy, tolerable for them to hear. I, mean, you, I, mean, I think, I wish it was even more besides abortion. I wish we could come up with a new mm -hmm. medical term. Our doctors here are kind of no, I don't think we need to stop using that word. Okay. No. Abortion is health care, period. Okay. It's health care. No. And, and we don't need this discussion of timing. I'm not putting any limits on it because our doctors are the ones that are trained and know what to do. And I don't want government telling them how to do do their job at any point in in my healthcare. Um, I don't want, I don't want us <laughs> interfering with that. That's not our place. So I mean, you heard some Republican politicians say life starts at conception, and now they're hedging their bets and saying 15 weeks. I mean, they're wishy-washy and hypocritical. We we need to talk about abortion as health care, and we don't need to put restrictions on it. Do you have to follow on to that to say, you know? So coming here and showing up at the Capitol, reaching out to your reps, all of those things are valuable, they matter, and they work. And I think 
telling the stories about real people and what is happening to them. You don't have to disclose anything private or confidential, but the realities of healthcare for almost every woman in the state, and in some way or shape, has experienced some related element related to reproductive freedom, period. It affects all of us. And I heard something the other day and I thought this is fantastic. You know, especially ask your legislators, and this may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be. Ask the men in your lives, ask the people around your tables, in your churches, in your sororities, your fraternities, your workplaces. The woman that's in your life or the person in your life who goes to see an OBGYN, do you know every year at their annual exam what happens? Do you know what a pap smear is? Do you know how it's conducted? Do you know why it's conducted? If you don't even know the basics of annual health care checks, how could you possibly begin to have an informed opinion about what other people should be doing with their doctors? Let's just continue this conversation of health care. What is it? Our kids, often, they don't know. We don't have sex education, comprehensive, evidence-based in our schools. And now we have bans on books, limiting even more information for those who were curious, curious to say, I want to know what this natural human element of our body and our physiology and our biology is all about. And those, I believe, are some of the conversations that can help to normalize and to say, this is health care. And we are being denied our basic rights to bodily autonomy and our basic right to health care. I think it's a great question, and I think we need to continue to consider it. I usually put it in quotes and criticize whatever it is. Yeah, I use that messaging quite a bit. Yeah, this is all about control. Yes. Can I make a quick comment Sure. announcement? So um, I have to go because we have a blood mobile here today and oh, yeah. everybody can come donate. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, it leaves at five and then I have another meeting. So for those of you that want to really do something today and are able to give, okay. I, I highly encourage you to give, um, would invite you to join me. I'm so sorry to disrupt, but it is an important medical thing. So <laughs> no, I told him I was gonna go by, so well, there you go. We'll go yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, ma'am. I have a question that is probably more for the physicians, but um, since a lot of people don't realize that abortion health care is not just women, since minor girls can get pregnant, and they share who's been affected by the joint ban, since it's not just adult women that are affected. I'm sure they can tell us an age, but I know that I have talked to a pediatrician that said that has been not vocal, vocal, but has had conversations with me about the fact that he has children coming in who have been raped by their uh, family member and are now being forced into these decisions as well. I'm sure you guys have stories as well. I mean, 12, I mean from the time they have are able to get pregnant, you're probably seeing it. Correct. Okay. Yes, Jeff. Which organizations can we donate to or support which would help before the reproductive act eventually passes in Georgia? The yeah, Adam State, or what organization help people to get to the place in the state of the I'm trying to talk I'll say it, say it all. It talked to us all a lot. It talked to us over here. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. Yes. Arc Southeast. Arc Southeast. Yeah. Arc, yeah. Arc Southeast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that are getting people out of the state. Um, anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Thank you for joining. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> you.